Hello, Festival of Resistance. I am standing in solidarity with you. My name's Shane Claiborne. I'm here on the East Coast of the United States in the city of Philadelphia, the city of love. Uh, and we also are deeply concerned about the environmental crisis, the, uh, the, the ravaging of God's earth, the irresponsible uh, greed and consumerism and the disposable society, all the ways that we are trampling on this precious earth. Uh, I want to tell you that I wish I could be there with you, but I'm thinking of all of you as you gather. I'm grateful for my friends at Christian Climate Action, uh, as well as the Red Letter Christians UK movement, all the folks over there that love Jesus and care about justice. So I'm thinking of you. I wish I could be there in person, but I want to say I am vigilant with you um, as you gather, as you discern how to move the hearts and minds of more people to respond to uh, the crisis, the environmental crisis that we're in right now. Um, I went out before I started recording this and got some grapes out of the garden, which uh, I have to say, every time we grow food in the concrete of North Philadelphia, it's magical. And we, for 25 years, we've been trying to break open the concrete and build uh, a, a community gardens, paint murals, uh, grow our own food, right? And, and, and it's holy work as we do it. We've got worms, vermicomposting and rain barrels and an aquaponic system. We've got gray water that's flushing toilets with dirty sink water. So we're trying to do what we can to live responsibly in this neighborhood, in this world. Uh, but we also have to recognize that uh, even as we're trying to live responsibly as individuals, that we've got to challenge the principalities and powers, as scripture calls it, the systemic forces that are destroying life and the creation itself. Uh, and, and so this work that we do, um, is holy work. We, we've been um, breaking open concrete and making gardens here uh, for 25 years. Um, we've also been grieving the state of the world. Um, I remember a young man several years ago told me that it is easier to buy a gun in North Philadelphia than it is to buy a salad, to buy a salad. And now we you know, have language for the food deserts, the places that it's so hard to get locally grown food. Um, and we're suffering from the biggest uh, loss of life from gun violence uh, that we've ever seen in the history of our city and, um, and really throughout the country here in the US. Uh, but these issues all connect, right? I remember one of my neighbors, some of my best theology comes from uh, right here in the neighborhood, even though I went to seminary and all that stuff. But one of my neighbors said, I get what we're doing. She's in the garden. And she, I said, what? She said, we're trying to bring the Garden of Eden to North Philadelphia. I said, amen, because I, it, you know, I think this whole story of the creation begins in a garden. Uh, but as you read the trajectory of the Bible, we don't, we don't go back to the garden. We bring the vision of the garden into the city. And one of the last images that we have in Revelation is the city of the new Jerusalem, this beautiful kind of vision for the dream city of God on earth. And as the, the, the book of Revelation talks about the new Jerusalem, it, it has a vision that the river of life runs through the city. The tree of life flourishes. Uh, and it's interesting because it says that there are no gates in the city. The gates are left open. So people are welcome. People can live without fear. Uh, but it's the flourishing of the city of the new Jerusalem uh, that catches my attention. So the, the Bible begins in the garden, but it ends 
in the city, in, in a city brought back to life. This vision that the world can be renewed, that we can live responsibly. I'm pretty sure that uh, river of life and tree of life and Revolu revelation, they, they weren't polluted, they weren't contaminated. And yet it's interesting because as the new Jerusalem comes, Revelation also says that Babylon falls. And Babylon is sort of that uh, iconic image of empire, right? Of, uh, and, and as the empire falls, there are two different responses. Uh, th this is the wonderful work of my partner, Tony Campolo. He says, as you look at Babylon falling in Revelation, Tony says there's two different responses. There's the response of the kings and the merchant of the earth. The folks that had, as Revelation says, grown rich off of Babylon and the adulteries. There's this kind of relationship that is uh, 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 very much about exploiting the earth, that they had gotten rich off of Babylon and the kings and the merchants weep. They weep and they say, oh, Babylon, how could you have fallen? They're grieving the fall of Babylon. But there's another response. And it says the angels rejoice. They rejoice as Babylon falls because it offers a new possibility for that new Jerusalem to flourish on earth. And so uh, Tony uh, always says the question for us is, well, will we be? weeping with the merchants and the kings, or will we be rejoicing with the angels as the empire falls? I, I want to say that I, I think it's, it, it is an incredible time to be alive right now. Uh, that in so many ways, we're at a crossroads in our country and in, in, in Europe and, and really throughout the world where we have a choice of how we will live and how we will respond to the degradation of God's creation. And for too long, Christians uh, have been one of the obstacles when it comes to the environment and creation care. You would think that we who worship the creator every week would be the most, uh, the greatest protectors of the earth. But that hasn't always been the case. And part of the reason is that we have had a theology that is about escaping this world rather than transforming it. And I want to invite us together to do better theology. Uh, as another friend of mine says, uh, the answer to bad theology is not no theology, but it's good theology. And so we need to do good theology. And there's a lot of bad theology out there that is uh, just about going to heaven when we die. And it ends up being just a ticket into heaven and a license to ignore the suffering of the world we live in right now. Uh, as, as some have said, some Christians can be so heavenly minded that we're not much earthly good. Uh, because what ends up happening is that we are just promising people that there's life after death, while a lot of people are asking, is there life before death? And doesn't the God of creation care about this world? And I want to say, that God does care about this world. As you look at Jesus, almost every time he opens his mouth, he talks about the kingdom of God, but he doesn't talk about it just as an escape from this world. He talks about the kingdom of God as something we are to pray and to seek and to bring on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, my friends, our faith is not just about going to heaven when we die. It's about bringing heaven to earth while we live. It's about bringing the Garden of Eden into North Philadelphia. It's about bringing God's dream onto the streets of our cities and our countrysides. It's about saying, what would it look like if God's dream were to be realized, to be actualized, and we then begin to live differently. It's been said that hope changes the one who hopes. There's a scripture that talks about hope and says, who hopes for what they see, but we hope for what we don't see. We're believing in the impossible. I think it was Nelson Mandela that said, before every social movement that, that has changed the world, before it happened, everybody said it's impossible. And after the social movement happened, everyone looked back in retrospect and said, 
it was inevitable. What looks impossible right now may look inevitable in, in, you know, a generation from now, but I want to say it is young people that are, are raising their voices and saying, we have a crisis on our hands and we have to respond. Christians, we have to respond. I, I heard one pastor say that he had no problem driving an SUV, a, a giant truck, because he saw it as just expediting the apocalypse. He's quickening the second coming of Christ. And literally, this is terrible theology, right? This is literally someone saying, I don't care if I live in a way that destroys the earth because I will just quicken the second coming of Jesus. That's a messed up theology. And so we've got to do better theology. Even the scriptures that are sometimes used uh, 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 to, to say this world is not our home. Uh, if you take a closer look at those scriptures, there's so much more going on. Even some of the scriptures that talk about the world being consumed by fire. Uh, as you look at those scriptures, it's not that the world's going to be uh, destroyed. It's, it's a refining fire, not a destructive fire, that God is refining the earth. God is redeeming all things. God made this world and called it good. And God's been calling it good ever since. As you look at this world and, you know, even as we, we grow food in North Philly, we've, we've seen some of our first cardinals that we've ever seen praying mantises. I saw a kid, uh, this kid came to knocking at my door and he was hysterical. At first I thought there was um, an emergency or something. And, and, but then he, he, he said, no, 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 come here, come here. He drags me outside to show me a firefly a lightning bug, right? This, and he said, what, what is that? It was the first time he'd ever seen a firefly. We don't have many of them in North Philly. And, and I, I said, my brother, that was a great day for God. God made a bug that's butt glows in the dark. How cool is that? How awesome is our God? God has made miracles. God took dirt and breathe life into it to make us in God's own image. God made this world of uh, things like the duck-billed platypus, right? The rhinoceros, the all the, the beautiful uh, parts of creation and all of its biodiversity is, an, is the fingerprint of God. And right now, so much is at stake. Uh, I... I I think it's a time for that requires some good trouble. And that's what you all are doing at the Festival of Resistance. I, I think of the great words of uh, uh, Jacques Ellul, the wonderful French thinker. He said, I don't know where we get the notion that Christians are meant to be normal, that we're just meant to be good law-abiding citizens that defend the status quo. We said, no, if you look at history, you see a different story. Christians at their best have been holy troublemakers. They have been creators of divine mischief. They've been folks that refuse to accept the world as it is and insist on building the world as God wants it to be. And so that holy troublemaking, you know, that's uh, what we've been up to for the last 20 years or so here on the north side of Philly. We've um, We've gone to jail a few times. I don't think everybody has to go to jail, but I think there's a place for it. We have a rich tradition of civil disobedience uh, in the Christian church in particular. I mean, even the Jewish community all through scripture, you see uh, some holy troublemakers like, uh, uh, well, you go all the way back to Moses. Moses's birth was in defiance of the death dealing policies of Pharaoh. Uh, Moses' uh, birth was a subversion with the Hebrew midwives that rescued him, and the, the folks that subverted the forces of death. And you keep reading and you see that the whole story of the Exodus is God rescuing a people from slavery and, and from uh, abuse and exploitation. In that story, there are constant resistors, folks like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who refuse to uh, adhere to the royal order and their throne in the 
the fiery furnace. You think of Daniel who served inside the empire. He was in the king's court, but he wasn't drinking the king's Kool-Aid, right? He resisted and he was thrown in the lion's den by Darius the king. Uh, the prophets were people who were disturbers of the peace. Uh, Jeremiah was jailed. John the Baptist was beheaded. He was, he was killed. Jesus was jailed. Uh, the, the, the constant stories of the early Christians were a collision with the powers of the world that they lived in because they insisted that life is precious and that, that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. And that meant, uh, that meant a different kind of allegiance. As the uh, book of Acts unfolds, you see the early church, they were resistors. Uh, they, they had a way of saying, we are going to obey the law of God, the law to love, not the laws of man. And it sent them to jail. Even Paul went to jail. Paul, who's often uh, quoted by defenders of the status quo, that he wrote Romans 13 and says, all authority is established by God. But what's interesting <laughs> is that he also writes the book of Ephesians where he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, not against people themselves, but against the principalities and powers. And he uses that same word he uses in Romans, that we wrestle against the authorities, the powers uh, uh, that, that are oppressing life. And he goes to jail for it. Um, so isn't that something? I think there's something to this idea that's been called revolutionary subordination. And it's the idea that we are to respect the authorities, but that doesn't always mean that we obey them or that we uh, uh, conform to the, to the patterns of this world of consumerism, of disposing things, of even treating people uh, as only valuable for what they can produce. And so there's that beautiful place in Romans that says, we are not to conform to the patterns of this world, uh, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're to live with a new imagination. And that means that we will not conform to the patterns of racism, that we will not conform to the patterns of inequity where masses of people are living in poverty while a handful of people uh, are, they are accumulating more wealth than we can ever imagine. Three people, I think it is, that now own the same amount as 50 countries combined economies. People that, CEOs that are making 500 times what their workers are being paid. Folks that are making money, we can't even imagine that now less than 100 people own the same amount as half the world's population. So something's wrong with that, right? That kind of uh, greed and consumerism. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi said that there is enough for everybody's need but there's not enough for everybody's greed. Come on, somebody, you can say amen to that. There's enough for everybody's need, but there's not enough for everybody's greed. God didn't mess up and make a scarcity of resources or uh, make too many people. No, God created an economy where there is enough for everyone. For everyone's need, but not everyone's greed. For everyone to have this day their daily bread. But it's when we start to stockpile more that we get in trouble. Uh, the beautiful place in, where Jesus says that uh, there's someone that had a barn to put all their extra surplus in. And then they had so much they needed to build a bigger barn. And God just tears it down and says, who are you to stockpile so much while people have so little? You don't even know if you'll be alive tomorrow that we are to pray and to live that every in a, in a way that everyone would have this day, their daily bread. So this crisis that we're in, you are responding to at the festival of resistance. Uh, and I wanna say a word about the good trouble. Um, you know, I meet Christians all the time that tell me their testimony and often it includes going to jail you know, a life of crime or drug addiction or whatever. And then I met Jesus and everything came together. And uh, if that's your story, God bless you. But I got to tell you, my story's a little different. I pretty much have my life together. 
and I met Jesus and he messed me up. I read the Sermon on the Mount where it says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Love your enemies. All of these things that just challenged everything in this world. And, and, and uh, so now, you know, I think I, I didn't go to jail before I was a Christian. I, I went to jail uh, since I've been a Christian probably 30 or 40 times <laughs> doing, doing the good trouble. Uh, you know, we started going to jail resisting laws that were anti-homeless laws. They discriminated against the homeless. Philadelphia passed laws that made it illegal to sleep in public, illegal to give out food, illegal to ask for spare change. And we resisted those laws. We went to jail challenging those laws. And I got to tell you, uh, we went to court and I had a shirt on that said Jesus was homeless. And the judge said, Jesus was homeless. Tell me about that. And I said, Your Honor, the scriptures in the scripture, Jesus says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus was homeless. And the judge said, you guys might stand a chance. And we did. We argued our case. And uh, the judge ended up saying, listen, I am very clear that you that these people broke the law. And he said, but they are not criminals. They are freedom fighters. And then he went on to say, think about the history of the United States. Our history is built on the good trouble, the holy mischief. He said, from the Boston Tea Party to the civil rights movement, people went to jail for justice. And if it weren't for people who broke the bad laws, we wouldn't have the freedom that we have. That's how we ended slavery. That's how apartheid fell. We had folks marching in the streets resisting. And so resistance is holy work. St. Augustine said, an unjust law is no law at all. It is our job to not conform to the patterns of this world, even if it means a little bit of holy disruption. Uh, I've got on my wall a, a picture of Dr. Martin Luther King, but this one's so beautiful that because it's got him with his uh, jail shot there. A reminder that Dr. King was a holy troublemaker. And Dr. King uh, said so many things, but one of the things he said is that traffic lights are good things. We need traffic laws. They're good things. But when there is a fire blazing, the emergency vehicles go right through the red lights in order to save lives and put out the fire. And there is a fire blazing, Dr. King said. I'd, I think he would say it today. There is a fire blazing. And so traffic laws are good things, but there comes a time where the emergency at hand, the fire that is burning, uh, 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 requires that we go through the traffic lights in order to save some lives. And it's for that reason that Dr. King, you know, he went to jail. And he, at one point, he said he was a little uncomfortable going to jail at first, but then he looked at history and he saw what good company he had behind bars. <laughs> those saints of old, those freedom fighters, those folks who stood on the right side of history, many of them went to jail. Many of them uh, had a fire in their bones that meant they couldn't just continue with business as usual. And it's also why Dr. King was accused of being uh, maladjusted. People threw that to him as an insult, especially when you would go to jail or you would, you know, disrupt things a little bit with nonviolent direct action in the streets. And Dr. King embraced what was meant to be an insult. And he said, maybe I am maladjusted. We, you know, he said, we live in a world that has become way too adjusted to injustice. We live in a world that has become way too adjusted to racism, way too adjusted to poverty, uh, a world that has become way too adjusted to the destruction of the earth. And Dr. King said, we need some holy maladjusted people in the world right now. We need some folks who will not conform to the world as it is, but we'll build the world that we know God dreams of. And so I'm praying for you all, cheering you on at the festival of resistance, uh, uh, particularly those of us who call ourselves Christian. 
who dare to call ourselves Christian. We've got to ask, what does love require of us right now? What does loving our neighbor, loving God uh, and the earth that God created, what does that love require of us right now? And Dr. King said that the church is not meant to be the servant of the state, nor is the church meant to be the master of the state. The church is meant to be the conscience, the holy conscience of our society. But what does it look like to be the conscience right now? As you may know, some of us have been uh, turning guns into garden tools uh, like this. This is a shovel made out of a gun. Actually, every part of it, the wood is from the gun, the, the uh, tool is from the gun. Sometimes I tell people this is what a gun looks like when it's been born again. <laughs> and every time we look at these, we are declaring that all things can be made new. This is a garden tool made entirely out of a gun. And you think uh, all things can be made new. Right now, we need to imagine what policies would look like if they were driven by love rather than by consumerism or greed or fear. What does it look like to, to have love fuel how we're thinking about our resources? And I, I think of, uh, you know, as we're doing this work, um, Walter Brueggemann, who I, I just uh, interviewed for our Red Letter Christians podcast, he was on Premier Radio over in the UK. Um, Walter Brueggemann, he wrote this wonderful book, The Prophetic Imagination. And he said, sometimes we get the prophets wrong. We think that the prophets, the biblical prophets, we, we sometimes think of them like they were fortune tellers, that they were trying to predict the future, but that's not quite it. The prophets were not fortune tellers, they were truth tellers. And they weren't trying to predict the future, they were trying to change it by waking us up in this present moment. Those prophets, they were trying to shake us and say, this is where we're headed, but it doesn't have to be that way. We, uh, uh, we can live into a different future. And that's what you all are doing right now, saying it doesn't have to be this way. And so we're not just protesting. We're protestifying. We are protestifying. We are proclaiming how the world could be made different, how we could live into a different reality than where we are headed right now. So pro protestify, y'all. Let's name the things that are wrong, but let's also proclaim how the world can be healed and how we can live into a different future than the one we're headed towards right now. So thank you for your courage, for your holy mischief, for that prophetic imagination. As you gather there, I'm standing with you. I'm singing with you. I'm eating grapes with you, uh, proclaiming how good God's creation is. And we're doing the holy good trouble, reminding folks that, uh, there is a crisis right now, and we can't just go on with business as usual. And I hope that a generation from now, they will say, when they tell the story of how we made changes as a world to honor God's earth, I hope that they will talk about the Christians and the role that Christians played, not alone, but as allies and advocates, as folks who stood in solidarity with others and said, this earth matters. And heaven is not just something we go to when we die, but something we're bringing on earth while we live. This is about the renewing of God's earth, not the destruction of it. May it be so. And when Babylon falls, may we rejoice with the angels, not weep with the merchants and the kings. May we have a vision for the kingdom of God, for the new Jerusalem coming on earth as it is in heaven, in London, in Yorkshire, in Philadelphia, in Manchester, and all over uh, the world. May we see God's dream come on our streets and in our neighborhoods. I love you. Bless you. I hope to see you soon.